Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. We're starting a new sermon series this morning where we're gonna use biblical stories that can be interpreted a variety of ways to think about how we interpret the events of our own lives. Kind of a mirror, if you will. Uh, today, we're gonna to start with part of the story of Joseph uh, in the book of Genesis. Um, if you've ever seen Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, that's the same skeleton for the story. And um, I'm going to read from Genesis 37, 17 to 35. Here we go. Joseph was sent to look for his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When his brother Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him in the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and then take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe of many colors that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him in the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that his brother Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes, a sign of repentance or sadness. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the blood in the robe. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. Jacob recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Is there some event, circumstance, or choice that defines your life? I suppose in a certain way all of them do, but some loom larger and more definitive. And so it was in the story of the biblical character Joseph. He was one of the sons of Jacob and as a young lad quite full of himself. He had dreams of ruling over his brothers and was not shy about talking about them. He was also his father's favorite. So the jealousy and annoyance of his older brothers is not surprising. What is surprising is the lengths they went to. They nearly murdered him, but wound up selling him to some slavers instead. The slavers took Joseph down to Egypt with the assumption that he would never be heard from again. The other sons of Jacob lied to their father, telling him that Joseph was killed by wild animals. So I'm interested in this idea of how you narrate or tell the story of your life. I would have to imagine such a crime, the selling of a brother into slavery would make a big impact on that family. And the fact that it was held secret uh, by the guilty parties would have weird effects on their family relationships. Could any of them ever fully trust each other again? Did any of them ever threaten to disclose the secret to their father, Jacob? What kind of fights and dirty dealings happened in the background? How much binge drinking as they grappled with the guilty truth of what they had done? 
How many nightmares did they have as they imagined their father sitting in judgment over them as the deed became known? Speaking of Jacob, how hard it is to have a child die. It is a terribly traumatic, a central pain that probably never fully heals. Every time someone asks you the most common questions in the world, how is your family or how many children do you have? I have to expect that some part of your mind goes to the death of that child and inwardly you sigh. Meanwhile, there's Joseph himself. How does one live knowing that one's own family has done this horrible thing to you? No doubt he heard them debating whether to murder him or not. Then they decided they would profit by selling him instead. That sense of betrayal. I, I literally wonder how one lives with that. But Joseph not only survived, but thrived. Some of the credit goes to him. He was a righteous man. There's the story where he refuses to commit adultery with the wife of his owner when he was a slave. And then he persevered through a long stint in prison. And then finally, unexpectedly, he's able to interpret some dreams for Pharaoh and gain such respect that Pharaoh appoints him as a high advisor. He eventually achieves such a position of promise that he essentially becomes Pharaoh's chief of staff. And then the most remarkable thing happens. A simply amazing thing. Something he had dreamed about during all those years in prison. Not only does he meet his brothers again, but they are completely in his power. They have come to Egypt to buy food. Assuming he is dead or a lowly slave, they do not even recognize him. They are ignorant and powerless, and Joseph may do what he wants with them. He may take his vengeance on them, and no one will tell him no. He is, after all, Pharaoh's right-hand man, and his commands will be carried out by all the armies of Egypt. And there they are, right in the center of his power. The brothers who beat him, betrayed him, spoke of murdering him, but sold him into slavery instead. Who could fault him for a dreaming of revenge? But he does not take revenge. Well, not much anyways. He does not kill or torture them, but he did play some head games with them. He knew who they were, but they did not know who he was. I don't have time to go into the details, but there are several journeys back and forth from Israel to Egypt, some purchases of grain, some silver planted to make the brothers look like they had, were thieves. Um, but in the big picture, you know, let's talk about the brothers themselves. Here's what they did as all these odd things were happening to them. They found, formed an interpretation of events. They told a story about what was happening and why they thought it was happening. In Genesis 42, 21, they say to each other, surely we are being punished because of our brother Joseph. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this calamity has come to us. Did you hear what happened? They saw some things that were happening to them, and they assigned a cause. Their conclusion was that God was punishing them for the evil thing they had done to their brother. Now, here's the question. Was their conclusion correct? Can we say that it was actually the case that they were there because God was punishing them? If you were in the sanctuary in our church service this morning, I would, I'm would. i going to ask people that question. For you will just, I, who are watching an internet land, we'll just move on. You know, obviously we cannot say for certain, right? There is no evidence in the biblical text that that is what God was doing. But there is also no evidence that God was not. Their brother Joseph, whom they assume long dead, was messing with them, taking a little playful vengeance. But that doesn't mean God wasn't somehow behind it. Now, a while later, Joseph can no longer contain himself and admits the truth to his brothers. I'm going to read some verses from Genesis 45. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. 
Now, like his brothers, Joseph has an interpretation of the events that brought him to Egypt. He claims it was to fulfill God's purposes. So here's what he says. Come, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a, you for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance so then it was not you who sent me here but god god made me father to pharaoh lord of his entire household and ruler of all egypt now hurry back to my father jacob and say to him this is what your son joseph says God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. So Joseph considers the events of his life and comes up with an interpretation of them a story, a narrative to explain what has happened to him. He states that God used his brother's evil act to get him to Egypt so that he would then be in a position to save the family. The trials and hardships that he faced were all a part of God's plan. And so now I have to ask the same question. Was Joseph's conclusion about that correct? Again, the Bible does not really tell us the answer. All we can say with certainty is that this is the version of events that Joseph believed. Now we can go a smidge further and state that it seems to be consistent with the way God sometimes works to redeem suffering. But the Bible's not definitive on Joseph's specific case. And there are lots of verses in the Bible that emphasize that the ways of God are mysterious. Ecclesiastes 11.5, God's ways are mysterious as the pathway of the wind and as of the manner in which a human spirit is infused into the little body of a baby while it is yet in its mother's womb. That one will make your head spin. But there's more. Isaiah 55.8-9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, neither are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Romans eleven thirty three to 34 Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that may we may we do all the words of his law. So here are two guidelines for how to interpret the events of your life. First of all, if God wants you to be 100% clear on what God is doing, God will be 100% clear with you. And second, if God has not been 100% clear, then you have some flexibility, some choice about how you interpret things. Most of the time, like Joseph and his brothers, you do have a choice about what kind of story you tell about the events of your life and about what God has done for you. Joseph's brothers, in the midst of their trouble, assume that God is punishing them for their sin. And sometimes that happens. If you have some good cause to suspect that God is punishing you for some sin that you have never repented of, and the events of your life are leading you to seek or to repent and to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with whoever you wronged, well and good, do that. But Every time something unpleasant or painful happens to you, do not assume that God is punishing you. Chances are God is not responsible. Some human being is. 
But you do have to pay attention. Be alert. Be like Joseph. Look for God's hand in your life, especially when good things happen. Joseph looked over the events of his life and came to believe that God was playing out a long-term plan for the sustaining and thriving of his whole family. Joseph would have loved Romans 8.28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So be attentive to the blessings God is giving you. Ascribe praise to the Lord. Be humble about yourself and gratefully give the glory to God. It is a good way to live. Over the course of uh, the next couple of months, we're going to look at other biblical stories which can be interpreted in various ways and see what we can learn from them. And my hope is that it will help us examine our own lives and consider how we tell our stories and that it will strengthen our faith. May God bless you all. Amen.